this episode of Me Great Minds, I have the pleasure of sitting down with legendary TV producer Vin DeBona, the man behind several of America's most popular TV shows like America's Funniest Home Videos. Vin DeBona, it's such a pleasure to have you here in My Stockholm. pleasure, my pleasure. Like, it's a beautiful city. I know, and you know, we bought the sunshine for you. Yes, thank you. Or you bought the sunshine well, to us. Well, either way, it works. Well, it's a great pleasure to have you here. And you're here in conjunction with the Amaranthan Ball yes, yes. and the Swedish Meatball Weekend. Oh, yes. Very excited. Um, and yesterday you were honored, the first honorary um, guest of the Amaranthan uh, Weekend. Yes. How was that? Uh, very exciting. Very, um, very exciting to meet all the um, potential uh, Amaranthans. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a, f a night of fun. and. Um, uh, I was able to show some of the material from our show, although many of the people in, in, in the group uh, have young children, so if you have a young child, you're more than likely watching the show, mm. because the show does bring adults and children together, which is a very unusual thing while watching television. Definitely, especially in this day and age. Yes, exactly, mm. and I think it's part of the success of the show, and so many of the, many of the folks last night uh, are aware of the show and, and have fun watching. And the show that you're talking about is, of course, America's Funniest Videos. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it's been on air It's in its 25th year. 25 starting next fall. I mean, it's amazing. Yeah. And bearing in mind that it's your baby, because yeah, you're the producer yeah. of it, what do you think is sort of the key element of the success? Well, I think, um, once again, it's, it's about families coming together. It's a very rare time in, in families where um, anyone from uh, 5 to 15 have a chance to sit down with their parents or their grandparents to watch the show. There is sort of a uh, Disney-esque uh, tradition. Uh, if you'll notice, Disney will take out um, Snow White or any of their classic films once every seven years. And the reason for that is that there is a family cycle that that changes every six, seven, ten years, um, where new families are, are created, and so it's an opportunity for them to get that movie out again for a whole new audience, a whole new generation. And that kind of happens with our show, too. Because uh, we talked about it earlier, you know, looking at how the media landscape is changing mm -hmm. and digital distribution. And initially, one could say that America's Funniest Video, you're, that you were sort of the pioneer of what YouTube is today. Yes, yeah. Did, did you find that has the viewing changed or is it just the formats that are changing? Well, interestingly enough, I was watching eight years ago mm -hmm. a, a CBS News report and they said there's a new thing out, it's called YouTube and you can share things and l let us show you the kinds of things that you can share. Well, they had six clips on, on this piece and four of them were mine. So I was pretty oh. angry about that because my, my material was being taken from our library, shared with other people, and no remuneration. Mm. So I fought for the next five or six years to try and get not only myself, but all of Hollywood as things were being taken and, mm. uh, and, and displayed around the world with, with no royalties. Um, I finally realized that it, rather than fight them, which is everybody in the world, is to embrace it. So I've launched other new programs around the whole YouTube experience, and uh, um, it's proven very beneficial. And, and do you think that, I mean, is YouTube sort of going to be the future of how we consume and, and, and look at content or entertainment or news or whatever it might be? Well, I think it's a way for everybody mm. to share information, whether it's YouTube or I suspect in the next three to five years there'll be something even greater, even bigger, uh, a different way to do something, a different way to share files. Um, but I think that the world is interconnected family by family by family through the internet, and I think it's just the beginning. And is it, a, I mean, there are pros and cons with every True, change. Of course. What's your perspective, having you know been in the industry for so long, and yeah. sort of seeing the constant changes? Yeah, um, I think the bad aspects mm -hmm. are pretty damn bad. Um, I think that there's too much 
attraction for young people to get into trouble. My grandson, bless his heart, um, started on the internet about, he's 12 now, when he was about eight he started looking things up. He's, a, he's got a very um, inquisitive mind. Mm. Well, he was looking up an airline, United Airlines, to see about planes. And he wound up on the United, and this is in Los Angeles, the United Construction Company's website. Mm -hmm. So he ordered <laughs> 20 feet of chain link fence oh, that's and a porta potty. Wow, eight years old. At eight years old. And the company called back and said, we're just trying to corroborate this. You know, uh, the spellings weren't quite right, but then some contractors really don't know how to spell that much anyway. Mm -hmm. And so my daughter said, oh my God, he's ordered a porta potty to be delivered at the house. Oh, so That's at least a charming story. Exactly. Uh, it, it can go either way. Mm -hmm. I think the... Um, the information process for young people to learn about a myriad of things with just one or two key words mm. is astounding. Mm. Uh, I, 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 I feel very badly for the old um, Encyclopedia Britannica salesman who went door to door selling their wares. Those days are long gone. But the ability to look up a subject in a second mm. is pretty astounding. I know there's been a lot of debate about that, that because everything is so easy to Google today, that you're not, that humans or the kids aren't really using their brains in the same yeah. sense, because you yeah. always get the answer delivered instantly. Do you think that that's something that, well, just your personal point of view, is is a good thing with all the mass of information that we can consume it and it's always at hand, or, or that it can actually become a bit of a backlash? In long well, time? I think it's changed. I think. Um, uh, the idea of libraries is, is very difficult because um, the access is too easy and readily available, so why would you go to a library? I mean, that's a terrible thing to say, it, it is, but it is but true. It is true. So I, I think if you look at the way information is consumed now, especially with young people, They're doing three things at once. They don't necessarily watch TV. They're on their iPad, they're on their, their phone, uh, they are on their computer. Mm -hmm. And all of these things are happening in concert. Mm -hmm. Not separately, but in concert. So I think the way that we receive information and data has changed immensely over the past 10 years. And, and we only have to look to the future to, mm -hmm. to imagine what 10 years from now will be. Mm. Because I, it's also another thing that, that we spoke about earlier, the fact that because the younger generation is constantly instant gratification, they have a very short attention span, that also TV formats have to be changed, they have to be uh, more narrow. But, but also that maybe, because I know you were involved in a lot of documentary work, yes, which uh -huh. was very interesting, which uh -huh. I'd love you to just briefly tell us a bit about, but that sort of everything that has raises awareness maybe doesn't have the same possibility to break through because everybody just wants to be entertained by that cat who's well, true, you know, true. a bit of America's Funniest Video, true. which is a good thing, but still maybe it doesn't really give space for formats that are important. Well, I did a show called Entertainment Tonight mm -hmm. back in the early 80s. Mm -hmm. I was the second producer to be in on that show. And, uh, and 60 Minutes accused us of doing short fluff stories that were two and a half minutes long. Mm -hmm. Today, an Entertainment Tonight story is 12 seconds long. I mean, it's amazing. So it is pretty scary. Mm -hmm. um, whether those are changes for the best or the worst, um, the audience has to decide that. So if we look sort of five or ten years forward, mm -hmm. what do you think personally, out of a sort of a network or producer um, perspective, will be the formats that will be either new formats or emerging formats, or will reality still be, you know, a big part of what we're viewing? Or well, what 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 we find as producers, independent producers, and there are very few of us left. Mm -hmm. There may be ten or twelve really strong independent producers um, in reality programming um, in Los Angeles. And the reason is, in 1990, 
there were over a hundred independent producers. At the same time, I'm saying independent producers. Paramount was an independent producer. Universal was an independent producer. They were selling to the networks. They were big. And then there were small ones, too. They were probably more small than large. And you could own your show. I brought a show to a network. I had the format. I owned the show. In my, in my case at ABC, we shared the format. Uh, we had a 50% um, deal. 100 independent producers in 1990. In 2000, there were six wow, independent years, producers, yeah. And of those six, whether it was David Kelly, Stephen Bochco, any one of the top 10, they couldn't own their show anymore because the networks owned the show. They would get royalties, mm -hmm. some. Mm -hmm. They would get a very hefty paycheck for writing and producing but they couldn't own it. That's changed television dramatically. The issue of young people entering our business. I'm turning your question mm -hmm. around. No, but it's interesting. The, the, the idea of a young person coming up, your camera people here, mm -hmm. wanting to um, own their own show in the mm -hmm. future, mm -hmm. can't happen. Regardless of sort Cannot of if you look digitally? Happen. Digital, digital is, that will happen digitally too. It's already begun to happen. Um, and so, um, independent people work for a paycheck rather than for a piece of the pie, so and, to speak. And do you think that contributes to maybe losing that edge of passion and drive and? What it does is when there are so few networks, mm. um, most major networks own four or five cable outlets. Um, Disney owns ESPN, Disney Channel, um, uh, part of Lifetime, um, and two or three other uh, cable networks. So that even though there are more cable networks, they're still owned by one company. And when they're owned by one company, there is generally a company philosophy. If you have more independence, you have independent philosophies, exactly. something that might be against the grain rather than homogenous. Mm. And, and that's the issue. That's the information issue that's difficult today. But don't you think that's gradually changing? Because if you look at the digital landscape with web TV and you mm. know, the, the, the more opportunities of distribution, not saying that you will get the same audience span maybe as, as, as the networks, but still, isn't that sort of Those will out narrow. The the, the major networks will, will gradually overtake most of that. Most so of we'll that. We'll go back line. to conformity. And Correct. So That's the real issue here. Mm -hmm. so, so for example, if, I mean, speaking about owning, um, wanting to own your content, so what would you recommend for someone like me, you know, wanting to, for example, produce mm -hmm. this web TV series and, and doing it my way and yeah. organizing all the interviews and maybe getting mm -hmm. a sponsor. Mm -hmm. What would you recommend someone in my doing position? It fast. Doing, doing it fast. Doing it as quickly as you possibly can. Okay. Because two years down the road, you might not have that opportunity anymore. You know, uh, three years ago, many of us felt, wow, the internet, um, Yahoo, all of these areas opened up tremendous amount of new areas for us to capitalize in. Gradually, as we move on, these sort of oases in the television landscape are closing down and being bought out by larger networks. And does, did you think that that will also distil, distillate it down to just being the formats of, you know, reality or documentary mm -hmm. or talk shows? So it will still be traditional in our Format. I think I, I think that the the idea of different formats mm. will 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 pretty much um, still exist. Mm. But you know what's interesting? What ha what's happened in the U.S. several times is that <clears throat> a sports cable network will be sports. There will be a weather network. Mm. There'll be a Lifetime. There'll be um, uh, Bravo, um, True TV. Then about every eight or nine months, game show network they realized, you know, this might be too narrow casting. 
maybe we should do more. So you'll go to sell a show to a sports network and they'll say, well, we're not really doing sports that much. Or you go to the game show network saying, well, we'd really rather be in reality. So there's this like <clears throat> every year or two, just it's amazing change in the networks. And then they realize, oh my goodness, we've lost our fan base. People used to come to us because they like games, because they like sports, because Bravo had an interesting mix of people. So they, they go off to another, in, in another tangent, and they realize, well, we just lost our base. So then they start to come back again, and it's like an accordion. And every two years, all of this changes. And so we, as independent producers, have to almost stay a jump ahead to figure out where they're going to be What's popular today is not necessarily what you want to be producing. You want to be producing for the sort of next generation of what that channel might be. And it's a guessing game, both from us and it's a guessing game from them because they don't always really know. Basically, they want to hit. Mm. Well, hey, probably everyone yeah, does. Well, exactly. But do you think a hit is also, I mean, talent before used to be maybe the core of a format, but today nearly anybody can be a talent, bearing in mind that you know it's mm. user-generated content, and all of a sudden, someone who has a YouTube channel is, yeah. is the, new, the new talent. Yeah, there, there are uh, YouTube stars mm. now in America, well, all over mm -hmm. the world. Um, and these younger stars, these kids anywhere from 15 to 23, 24, they've figured out what their fan base is, and they... That's key. They use it mm. on a daily basis. They're continually updating. I, mean, I was, you know, there was this one uh, website with uh, a, a young Chinese woman, I think either from the U.S. or Great Britain, mm -hmm. and she had something like a billion hits. And her website was seven ways to tie a scarf. <laughs> how, many women, how many women do you know can't tie a scarf? Quite a few. In America, almost every woman. Times. has trouble tying scarves. Probably in Sweden or in France, they're, they're much more flamboyant about it because it's part of what they need to do to protect themselves and look cool. Interesting. But Keep over a billion hits, right? That's really interesting. And just to get back to, to you, how did you start out? In, in, I know that you started out as I uh, started out as a singer, yeah. yes, absolutely. Johnny. When I was 15, Johnny yeah. Lindy. Mm -hmm. I had a local, a regional hit. Mm -hmm. um, uh, at the time, the record company didn't have the right distribution, so it didn't um, didn't go national. Mm -hmm. And then on my second record, I released it just as the beat, and I was a ballad singer, so I released it just as the Beatles hit. So I went. Oh, oh, just sixteen. Uh, sixteen, yeah, yeah. Gosh. But what that. happened was, I went around to TV stations promoting the record, mm -hmm. and in and doing so, I got interested in TV and in radio, and I was a disc jockey for a while. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I went, I graduated from Emerson in Boston, and then I went to UCLA grad school and um, and studied documentary film. And uh, and of the 25 years so far of, of your professional life, what are you most passionate about, or what do you find? I'm passionate about work. Yeah. I love with, working. Mm. I love um, entertaining. Mm. I love making people laugh or making them think. Mm. Um, it's, it's part of my fiber. Uh, I, I work six days a week most of the time. I just turned 70 and I'm, wow. I'm really I happy to still be mm -hmm. doing what I like to do successfully and, and internationally. And it, it's just, I've been an entertainer since I was 15. Mm -hmm. And it, it's hard to get out of your blood. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And what's next in line? Are you, I mean, a new I'm show? Working, I'm working, well, you know, it, uh, I'd like to say I'm working on a show. We're probably working on 30 shows. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm working with a fellow named Chris Bengel, mm -hmm. um, who lives in Italy. And Chris designed the BMW for 20 years, oh. and the Mini Cooper, yeah. and Rolls Royce. And we're working on a show about how design has affected the world since the Egyptians. Interesting. Um, wow. We are working with several um, sort of celebrity folks mm -hmm. in Los Angeles about various different topics. I'm working with Arnold Schwarzenegger about a show uh, designed to um, show the idea of, of how um, athletics and bodybuilding around the world has affected everyone. 
Um, really interesting topics. Yeah, we're, we're spinning off uh, America's Funniest Videos into America's Funniest Game Show. Um, and those are just a few uh, of some of the pieces we're, we're working on. And, and would these all be uh, the ones that are selected or the ones you're actually going to um, produce? Would they then be viewed or distributed on your, your network through your production company? Or would you use the, the, the digital media landscape? Yes, yeah. Um, probably the game show would mm. be a spinoff, so that would be on ABC. Mm. Everything else is, uh, is up for grabs to, to what, what network thinks it might work for them. Mm, very exciting. Yeah. I'm also working on a show that uh, is a passion of mine uh, called the Songwriters Hall of Fame. All the major songwriters in the world come together once a year in New York for an incredible celebration of themselves and songwriting mm -hmm. and the stories behind the songs oh. and the stories that the songs are. Wow. Um, and they've been doing this for 44 years. It's never been televised before. So this is uh, something we're trying to launch in the next year. That sounds really So it's exciting. a really kind of interesting variety of shows. Um, part of, I think, the documentary experience uh, mm. throughout my life taught me that um, no subject is verboten, you know? Um, and and um, when I came to Hollywood, um, I didn't work for nine months, which was pretty shaky because I had a young, uh, a young daughter, a five-year-old. And I, I was actually managing the apartment building I lived in, because so, made the rent cheaper. Um, but during that time, I really experimented with a lot of different areas. And I was never afraid to do this here and do a game show, do a music show, do a documentary. And I think that's held me in good stead throughout my life. Yeah, and I must say, personally, it's really inspiring to also hear, I mean, the versatility, that that also is something that is appreciated, because a lot of the time we need to be very niched in order for, especially within yeah. media. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's really a source of inspiration. It's a trap mm -hmm. to be niched. You know. Yeah, I find uh, that too. But yeah. sometimes they can look and think it's a trap to be too versatile. Because yes. Really yeah. Yeah. But, but I think that's really inspirational. And, and um, just, you know, because for me, it, it's always, uh, nearly like like mentorship to talk to someone who has so much experience that you have. And what would you say to upcoming, you know, producers or mm -hmm. pe young people who want to become producers or directors? It's a universal answer I have. Mm -hmm. Never take no for an answer. Oh, I like that one. Mm -hmm. Never take no for an answer. Well, thank you so much for your time. My and um, you're now going to soon be in your tuxedo, yes, yes. and we're white gonna wine and tails. dine yes. at the Amarantum Ball, and um, it's a pleasure to have you here, and I hope to speak to you soon again. I'd look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.